this is Chris Gordon with Efficiency Vermont, and um, we're going to be presenting on the commercial building energy standards today. Uh, this is going to be a condensed version of the three-hour full commercial building energy standards workshop series that's been delivered throughout Vermont. And as with those trainings, uh, Tim Gitterman is going to lead us through the presentation today. And we're also pleased to have Keith Downs from Navigate Consulting uh, with us in the room as well. A couple of technical details. If you want to minimize the menu bar on your screen, there's a, an arrow at the top left you can click uh, that will minimize the menu bar. And everybody's on mute right now. We're going to be recording the webinar today. So if you have questions, please submit them through the question or chat box uh, feature on the menu bar. And we'll uh, have some time at the end to, uh, to answer those questions. And uh, with that, I will now hand it over to Tim. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, welcome. Sorry for any uh, technical hiccups right there at the beginning, but we'll uh, get going. Welcome to the 2011 Vermont Commercial Building Energy Standards webinar. My name is Tim Gitterman. I work with Navigate Consulting, a local company here in Burlington, Vermont. We've got offices uh, based in uh, Boulder, Colorado, Chicago, Illinois, and uh, other cities and towns around the country. My contact information is right there if you wish to contact, you, contact me afterwards with uh, any questions that don't get answered during this session, uh, code related or otherwise. Just a quick blurb, we do uh, a lot of work with evaluation, measurement, and verification. We uh, perform energy efficiency baseline studies and work uh, across the board with demand side management programs and assisting utilities and governments and utility commissions around, around the country with, uh, with DSM and EE programs. Um, as Chris said, we also have Keith Downs here. Keith Downs is with Navigant, uh, formerly was with Efficiency Vermont, and uh, he'll be assisting with some of our questions and, and trying to help everybody out um, throughout the session. So the agenda today is uh, we've got a little bit of housekeeping on go over about the webinar, some technical details, dive into the CB's update process, how did we get here, uh, why do we have a new code, and what went into it, when does this new code take effect, and some issues related to compliance. Got some suggested reading for you. Uh, we'll jump into the standards themselves and really walk through uh, the details on the, the, the major changes to the, the CVs. And, um, and then we'll do some Q&A. And actually, because this is a condensed uh, webinar, we're really not going to go into above code resources today. But uh, if anyone wants some information on that, we can, we can certainly deliver that to you. So just, just let us know. Some housekeeping items. Uh, this is the fourth workshop in a series that's gone on throughout this fall, sponsored by uh, Department of Public Service and delivered with Navigant and Efficiency Vermont as a partner. Um, we've got the final workshop is tomorrow in Newfane, Vermont, so in the southern part of the state. So if you, if you would like to join, please do. There's room there. Um, this webinar, as I said, is condensed from a three-hour presentation. And so really, we're going to focus on the major changes to the code and not some of the other details that might come along with, with just a, a longer workshop on, on energy code. Um, and there will be a follow-up email to uh, any attendees with uh, any necessary links to where the PowerPoint is posted or other uh, related CVs information. And this webinar itself will be recorded, posted online. And as, as Chris said, all phones are muted. So please submit your questions through the, uh, the, the webinar tool. So let's get into the CB's update process. Uh, Vermont accepted funds from the ARA, the ARRA, and uh, the requirements specify that we must meet the 2009 IECC or the ASHRAE 90.1 2007 as a baseline. That was the starting point. We had to update to a new code that either met that or exceeded that. Um, in Vermont, we had the 2005 CBs, which was based on an earlier version of the IECC and ASHRAE 90.1 code. And the state of Vermont wanted to carry over any Vermont-specific amendments from that, that uh, 2005 version, as well as add or adjust anything uh, deemed necessary. And ongoing during this update process was the, the updates to the national model code themselves, so the 2012 IECC and the ASHRAE 90.1 2010 were both being developed over the course of the last 12 months, really. And uh, so Vermont was lucky enough to be able to take those changes and, and incorporate them into, into our 2011 CBs code. So we weren't left with just the 2009 IECC. We were able to capture improvements and additions 
and any sort of changes that, that were uh, deemed relevant and valuable from, from those code updates. So just to be very clear, though, all of these things went into the code, but the starting point was really the 09 IECC. That's sort of what we, we couldn't go below that. But the, there's parts of 2005 CVs, and there's parts of the latest in IECC and ASHRAE all mixed in uh, together here. Now, we always get into this conversation when we talk about code is uh, what this, this large, sneaky elephant in the room, uh, as represented by the picture here. And uh, we just want to be clear, the update process that, that we worked on at Navigant uh, as part of with, um, on behalf of DPS, so doing the technical update to the commercial building energy standards, was not focused on addressing issues of enforcement and compliance, which are always a part of any uh, co code discussion, code conversation uh, related to the technical details. Well, what about compliance? What about enforcement? Um, the acceptance of the ARA funds required the state to develop a plan to improve compliance as well as evaluate compliance, and that's ongoing right now. Uh, there was just a, a meeting on, uh, I believe, Tuesday this week, um, if, if not yesterday, in Montpelier on presenting sort of a draft report on code compliance in the state of Vermont, both residential and commercial. So the state of Vermont Department of Public Service is actively involved working with the industry, working with, um, working with professionals to really make compliance work for everyone. So that's an ongoing process, and you can go to DPS's website uh, and, and find out more information about that, and I highly encourage that. Uh, but today, I'll go into a little bit about the compliance process for, for CBs, but we're going to really focus on technical updates to the code. So this is just a visual on the CB's compliance process. So what's involved if you're working on a project that needs to comply with the code? First, uh, as you design your project and finalize plans, you need to, both design and construction needs to be certified as compliant with the code. And we effectively have a self-certification process in, in, in most parts of Vermont. Uh, with, with some exception, it's really left up to the designers and the builders to, to certify compliance with the code. There's not, uh, there, there's no, at this point, no statewide inspection mechanism or, or entity that does real detailed code inspection. We do have the Department of Fire and um, Department of Public Safety, DPS, and Division of Fire Safety within that that does inspect uh, for the certificates that I'm going to talk about here. And, uh, but they, they're not exactly checking whether your wall R value uh, meets code or the HVAC system meets code. They're really just checking to see that did the designer and builder certify compliance with the code. So the overall process is the design and construction are both certified. And, and affidavits and certificates are completed by the relevant parties. And these certificates are permanently affixed and there's some language from the code or from the really from the legis legislative language that says they need to be affixed to the inside of the service panel, electrical service panel, or on the heating or cooling equipment or nearby in a visible, visible location. So ideally they should not be tucked away in a file somewhere. Now copies of this should be sent to the Vermont Department of Public Service as well as the local town clerk. Now, when proving compliance or showing compliance with the CBs, uh, we have historically and will, again, have ComCheck, which is a DOE-sponsored software that will be customized for Vermont's code. So any changes we made to the Vermont code uh, can be pulled up in a menu and uh, essentially loaded into the ComCheck software. So you can show lighting, envelope, mechanical, and water heating compliance. Now, just a note, when show, the lighting and envelope and water heating, the ComCheck software will actually sort of spit out a yes or no, a pass or fail kind of response uh, and, and try to show you whether your, your design meets code. The mechanical system really just, just tries to narrow down which requirements you have to meet. It won't exactly tell you yes or no, you, your, your HVAC system or systems have met the code. So moving on to the effective date of the CBs. This was adopted on October 3rd, 2011 by the uh, state legislature, by a committee there. And it will become effective on January 3rd for all newly constructed commercial buildings. 
as well as additions, alterations, renovations, or repairs. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion, and I will um, I will defer any uh, please provide or submit any questions. Um, but I will also uh, provide you some uh, the contact information for. Uh, we've been working a lot with Barry Murphy at the Department of Public Service, who has been fielding a lot of the questions from industry and contractors, designers, engineers, et cetera, on the code compliance process and, uh, and, and this effective date. Because the effective date really does say shovels in the ground after January 3rd, you need to meet this code. But the code is still being published by ICC. It's not really in your hands. There's a draft version on the web right now. So this presents real honest challenges. And, um, at this point, this is the way the legislation was written. It is the law. Uh, some of us have proposed various ideas. Maybe there should be a grace period or a little work with this one, and then at a certain hard end date, you need to meet the new code. That's not in place now, but there are legislators who, who are aware of, of those these issues with implementation, and it might be addressed in this session. But at, the best thing to do right now, if you have an issue with this, is to talk to the Department of Public Service, and we can send that contact information well, afterwards, and Barry is listening in on the webinar right now, so at the end, during the Q&A, maybe we can have him say some things if needed. I would like, if you're a code geek and like to go to bed reading about the energy code, get some uh, literature for yourself or just for your office, perhaps. Uh, I highly encourage, even though we have our own customized code, as we said, it's built on the national code. So anything related to the 2009 IECC or ASHRAE 90.1-2007, and the later versions of these, 2012 and 2010, are very useful. They make combined versions where all in one document, you can get all in one book, either digital or, or, phys or hard copy. You can have both of those in one place. Highly recommend the IECC commentary. It's a very layman's term, sort of layman's um, translation of the code. It has the code language in it, and then it describes in layman's terms what that might mean and how this could be interpreted. And the ASHRAE 90.1 user's manual, also similar, but uh, really helps to understand 90.1 and is much more technical than the IECC commentary. Provides psychrometric graphs, charts, HVAC system diagrams, a really good, helpful document to have. And there were free downloads in the last year. If you got them, then good for you. Uh, if not, you missed the boat and they're, uh, they're no longer available. So let's get right into it. Uh, you're all here to hear more about the Commercial Building Energy Standards, so we'll, we'll, we'll start, start talking about it. An overview of what we're going to talk about today is uh, going through some key items, just some background, some support, uh, supporting information. Then we'll move through sequentially through the code. So what the code is laid out in terms of administration, definition, and so on, as shown here, and we're going to move in that order. Some of the key items to know are that the 2012 IECC and 90.1-2010 were just finalized in late 2010. Um, these, the major changes in these codes, particularly in the 2012 IECC, were really sponsored by uh, a collection of organizations, Department of Energy, New Buildings Institute, and the AIA, American Institute of Architects. The three really prominent organizations involved in energy efficiency got together and submitted major changes to the code. Uh, so there's a lot of validity in these changes, and a lot of these that are adopted in, two, in the 2011 CBs, uh, they've just been they're, they're, they've been well vetted at this point. So it's um, that's some background to know. And just a note on presentation format, I always try to try to joke that uh, one of the most exciting things of your code presentation is today is that we get to violate all the rules of PowerPoint. So there's probably too many bullets, maybe too many numbers and cases, um, and, and too much text up there occasionally. But it's, uh, it is a technical document, and we want to communicate some, some items to you. And sometimes you just got to bend the rules a little bit, so just a caveat. Let's start right into Chapter 1, which covers administration. And I'll, I've got a question for you, and even though no one can answer, it's just something to think about. So which building, which building on this list is not covered by this code? We want to talk about the scope of the code. Uh, would it be a three-story multifamily building, an elementary school, a five-story apartment building, or a single-story motel building? And the three-story multifamily apartment building is the only one in that list that's not covered under the commercial building energy standards. And the reason is that this code covers all buildings except R3, which is a classification for single detached homes and duplexes, 
And these R2 and R4 class, classified buildings that are three stories or less, those are, not, those are covered under what's called RVs, the Residential Building Energy Standards for Vermont. So things like apartments and dorms and multifamily uh, apartment buildings, those, are, um, the, the, those need to be four stories or more in order to be covered under CB. For each of these major chapters, I'll just have a, a slide of bullet points. It might be most helpful after if you pick up the PowerPoint online. It just kind of covers some of the major changes. And most of these we'll walk through. With the condensed version, we might have to skip some of these. And I might have pulled some out. But these are the major changes for each chapter. So the scope of this, of this code, it does not apply to farm structures, in addition to the, re the whether it's residential or commercial. There's some additional language. It does not apply to farm structures or process applications. And that's the exact language from the code that you see there. And that's really just to say that if you have a major printing operation and you're using these million dollar printers that are imported from Germany and the motor goes out, uh, you might very well just call somebody in Stuttgart, Germany and order a new motor that was specifically designed for that printing press. And that's considered part of a process application. It doesn't necessarily need to meet the code requirements. Likely, it probably will anyways. But that's the kind of thing it's covering. If it's an inherent in a process application, it's considered exempt from the code. And there are some exempt buildings, uh, ones that have a low sort of peak space conditioning energy use, any building that's unconditioned. And there's an addition in on this version saying inflatable buildings are exempt from the code. So then one of the tricky parts that uh, frequently gets questions are what to do on existing buildings when we're doing some additions or repairs or, or renovations. In general, a, 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 a nice rule of thumb might be if you touch it, if you touch a major system, you likely should bring it up to code. Um, the code actually says that additions, alterations, renovations, or repairs to an existing building, building system, or portion thereof shall conform. But it does not require the unaltered portions of the existing building to comply with the code. So that's a very clear distinction. If you're not touching part of the building, that does not have to be brought up to code. And of course, there's always exceptions, as there are in any energy code document. Some new exceptions. Uh, for purposes of time, I won't list all the old exceptions. I haven't changed. But there's some new ones added in. And these all come from the latest 2009 IECC had these new exceptions. So if you are doing a re-roofing job, but the sheathing or insulation is exposed, then it's, it's an accepted from the code. You can replace up to 50% of luminaires or fixtures as long as the load is not increased in the building. And if you're doing a retrofit, for example, if you were working through Efficiency Vermont and doing a bulb and ballast replacement, um, you would, and, and you're not increasing the load, then that does not have to, that work does not have to be brought into full compliance with the code. There are some changes to this section called change in occupancy. It used to be called change in occupancy. Now it's change in occupancy or use. So the old code required a building undergoing a change in occupancy, resulting in increased load, to comply with the code. The 2011 CBs still says the same thing, but it substitutes space instead of building. So it's kind of drilling down a little bit into space rather than building. And if you change the use, from one use to another in the lighting table that's in the, in the later part of the chapter 5 of the code, if you change from one use to another, then you need to comply with the installed lighting wattage requirements in, that, in those tables. And let's just give an example. So you're an online retail company. You're in Rutland. You've got 5,000 square feet of, of office space, open office space, but it's office space, people, computers, lights, all that stuff. Um, and you're gonna, you want to stock more of your goods. So you're going to change it to a warehouse space. And you're just going to gut all the lights. They're all coming out, new fixtures in rows, maybe the T8s. Um, and you used to have old T12s or something like that. So what does CBs require? Is it full compliance with the code for that space? Is it only the lighting power allowance for that space? Or is the space exempted from the code? And the answer is the second one. Only the lighting power allowance for that space. And the reasons why is because the load, you're going from an office to a warehouse. So the load is assuming, we're assuming it's not going to increase. And obviously you as the project representative would need to prove this with documentation. 
you're not increasing the load, you're going to a less energy intensive use of the space from an office to a warehouse. And you, you can't be fully exempted because more than 50% of the lighting is being changed. So you need to, you've now gone from one use to the other. As you put in your new lights for the warehouse, they need to meet this watts per square foot. And I'm missing a, just a unit there, but that's just one watt per square foot, and that's 0.6 watts per square foot for those space types. Another change, or an addition to the code here, is that any non-conditioned space that's altered to become conditioned space needs to be brought into full compliance with the code, just explicitly requiring that in the latest version of the code. In Chapter 2, there's definitions. We're not going to spend the next hour walking through these. I just want to tell you that there's new definitions, They and, and they're in the code, and be aware of them, look them up, use them as needed. This is a list of the new definitions. Chapter 3 is considered general requirements. And the major change here is in the design conditions section, 301.2. The 05 CBs had a broad allowance for adjustments. The 2011 CBs allows adjustments for two conditions. One is winter heating design temperatures for projects at 1,500 feet or higher located in those three listed counties, essentially the Northeast Kingdom. And any approval by the code official or other authority having jurisdiction. Where that exists, if you can get a, um, an override, then, then that, that would be approved. And essentially, there was just an adjustment allowed for local design conditions previously. And that's now been removed from the Vermont CDs. So we're going to move into Chapter 5, which is the meat of the Energy Code. When most people talk about the Commercial Energy Code, they're dealing with this, this chapter. This has all the, all the goodies in here. And right away, this chapter covers how to comply. What, what, what are your options? So you can use this Chapter 5, which is considered a general prescriptive approach. And you may use this chapter if you have less than 40% of the gross wall area in vertical fenestration. Vertical fenestration is a fancy code term for windows. So if less than 40% of your gross wall area is in windows, then you're good to go. You can follow this section. If less than 3% of your gross roof area is in squat skylights, then you're good to go. You can use the CV. Now another compliance path is ASHRAE IESNA standard 90.1-2007. And just to note, the 05 CVs always reference ASHRAE 90.1-2004, and that gets updated with every new code. So we're now referencing 90.1-2007. But the major change that's happened now is that you used to be able to comply with individual sections within ASHRAE. Or CB, so you could kind of you could comply with the CB envelope section, but ASHRAE 90.1 lighting, or mechanical systems in that 90.1 and envelope and CBs and vice versa. Now it's an either or proposition, so you either need to follow CBs, approve compliance through CBs, or approve compliance through ASHRAE 90.1 in its entirety. Now CBs does carry over some of its specific amendments are carried over to 90.1, so when you use 90.1, you need to reference some of the specific changes that exist in 2011 CBs, and those are laid out in the beginning of the document. And this is just a visual of sort of a compliance path. So envelope, there's, you know, depending on which document you're in, are you in CBs, are you in 90.1, it says the section number, and there's envelope, mechanical, and power and lighting. And you would ideally document your compliance with CBs, with your certificates and affidavits, you would post those, and uh, an occupancy inspection by the fire safety would occur, and that would verify whether or not your certificates have been posted as stated. So we'll get into the building envelope here. And these are some of the major, the major bullets for changes. A new group R category I'll, I'll briefly describe when we talk about envelope values. Insulation, things have changed some consolidations for skylight categories, and some uh, fairly significant changes to the air leakage requirements and, uh, and vestibules. On building envelope roof assembly, there's a requirement now that skylight and mechanical curves are required to be insulated to at least R5. So good to know. And I'll get into the envelope tables. 
just to be clear, since we have our own code, if you were to pick up the 09 IECC, you'd always have to find what climate zone you're working in because it is a national model code. Um, every value you'll see in our, in our CVs is for climate zone 6, which is where Vermont lies. There's additional metal building description and U-factor reference tables related to the envelope, um, the envelope values. So there's been a lot of changes to metal buildings. And as I already said, the vertical fenestration area is 40% maximum of above grade wall area. And that's equivalent with the 09 ICC. And just as a reference point, our current code, it was soon to be old code, the 05 CVs had a 50% maximum. So let's give a scenario for building envelope, and it ties back to compliance. If you have an owner you're working with, and they're, they have a design vision that they want this window-to-wall ratio of 45%. So they, they want a lot of glass on their building. Well, what to do? We know the maximum is 40%. So what are your options as a designer? Yeah, is it one, you have to reduce to less than 40%, or we go over to 90.1-2007 envelope section, or you have to model it following 90.1-2007 Appendix G. Now, I haven't mentioned what Appendix G is, but that's, a, that's a, 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 in a, in a, an alternative to the prescriptive approach of ASHRAE 90.1, and it allows you to model your building and show energy savings or design parameters above uh, the, what's allowed in the prescriptive approach. And that is the answer. So uh, you, you need to follow Appendix G. And the reason there is because, well, you could get the architect to go or the owner to just agree to go less than 40%, and then you could follow CB. So that would be number one. Um, but number, number two, 90.1 also has a requirement of 40% maximum. And there is a trade-off. Uh, the, uh, there's a budget, the tra um, forgetting the name right now, but there's a trade-off uh, energy budget method in ASHRAE 90.1. But that does not allow you to adjust that 40% window-to-wall ratio max. So let's get into some of the values. And as I said, there's a lot of numbers up there, but we'll just kind of highlight some changes. Major changes should be shown in red, and I'll just briefly mention them. And without much uh, vocal feedback here, it's a little different than the in-person presentation. Uh, but I will just present these to you. If you have any questions or follow-up, then please submit your questions uh, through, the, through the webinar tool. So for roof insulation entirely above deck, we've seen a change from what was in the 2005 CVs of an R24 continuous up to R30 continuous. And the minimum we had to be at was actually less than where we were before. So the 09 ICC, et cetera, was at R20. So that's been, and that's been raised. Metal building, I'll walk through some options, but the roof options there. Uh, the U factor hasn't really changed, but the, um, the compliance, the assembly options have changed. And in a nutshell, uh, and I could give any in additional information after this or um, in any follow-up discussions, there has been a lot of revisions to the actual U-factors of, of metal building assemblies. So what used to be, take this R19 of this insulation material and compress it between your, the metal roof and your, your framing or your purlins, it used to be this U-value. Well, they've done testing at national labs, and they've, they've determined that those U factors were probably in the order of anywhere 25, 40% plus um, off. So they were, they were essentially overstating the energy savings uh, of those assemblies. They really were performing, more, performing worse than we thought when installed. So there's been a lot of revisions, and those are incorporated in this code. The, uh, there's really no changes to the attic and other category. We were already at what was the 09 IECC, and that has not been elevated um, in this version of the code. So as an example for metal building roofs, one of the new additions here is this uh, liner system assembly. And that really gets you compliance with the code and is included in the 2012 IECC and ASHRAE 90.1-2010. And it gets you down to a U factor of 0.035. It has a, a specific definition. An example would be R19 plus R11 liner system. And I won't read this, but it's really a continuous membrane essentially topped with insulation between the purlins. And there's some definitions for multi-layer installations um, where you have the, that's the, that's the 
R19, that defines the R11 part of that. So the last rated R value. The R11 part of that is the unfaced insulation draped over purlin and then compressed when the roof panels are attached. So pay attention to that. That's, a, that's, that's new to the code. We get into above grade walls. We've got, this is the first example when you see the mass wall where there's a split out between group R and all other commercial buildings. So this is new in the 09 IECC where they now make a distinction if your building is just generally a commercial building or it has a residential uh, use as, as portion of it. So for example, a mixed use building where you might have retail on the bottom and four or five stories of residential apartments above. The residential apartments, uh, those, those envelope values need to meet the group R category. And they're typically a little more stringent. And uh, any other uses of the building or building types can fall under sort of that all other category, which is just the number as you see there. So there's been some changes to the mass walls. And there are some changes to metal building walls. The metal framed has effectively stayed the same. Again, the 2005 CVs was already where the 09 ICC is now. Um, and we've adjusted up to meet the wood framed and other requirements that were stated in, in the 2009 ICC. So the same U factor, the same um, cavity plus continuous assembly. One of the advantages of customizing your own code for your own state is you can add in these other options, such as this R20 plus R, plus a you know increased cavity and decreased continuous, or R23 alone, or just R15 continuous alone. Now, all of these things, the R value versus the U factor, if you use ComCheck, you can just build in your assembly. So you have a certain layer on the outside, air gap of this distance, this material, plywood, insulation, et cetera, you can enter all that in ComCheck, and it will tell you whether or not you comply, what your overall U factor for your assembly is. So I highly recommend that, that as a check on assemblies you're, you're designing. Below grade walls, um, we were already ahead of the 09 IECC in the 2005 CBs, and that has been maintained, so there's no change there. Floors. Some change to mass. There's a group R category now added to joist framing and metal. And there's no change for joist framing of the wood and other. Now I, wa I want to make a note for slab on grade. Uh, there's a current draft on the web that has some changes, um, a, a section in there that requires insulation to be placed on the exterior of the foundation. That language will be struck from the code, and it will be defaulted back to what was already in the 05 CDs and what is currently in the 2009 IECC. So this was a change that came through the public comment process, but has met significant uh, resistance since um, since it's been uh, sort of tossed around and during trainings. And so uh, that 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 one change has been revoked. Uh, we we can say. And so if you see that change on the slabs on grade language in the draft code, just, uh, just note that that will be changed and that will, th those changes will be posted online. So slab on grade floors, though, we, were, uh, we already required an R10 for 48 inches below uh, in the 05 CBs. And that still is ahead, sort of more energy efficient, more insulation value than in the 09 IECC. And that's been maintained. For heated slabs, uh, Vermont has historically required R10 for the entire slab, so both under the slab and the perimeter, and that as well has been maintained. And uh, I've asked people at ASHRAE 90.1 committees who essentially develop a lot of these values that then feed into the model codes, why, why, is that not, you know, why is that not a code requirement in the national codes for this climate zone? And essentially the answer is that they can't prove that that's cost effective from using their models and their fuel prices and all of that stuff. But typically, when I ask all of you out there during trainings and sessions, um, people say, yeah, that's what we do. R10, entire slab, why would you do anything else? I've heard that answer more than I can count and seems to be, uh, seems to be pretty standard operation. So we've got to change the doors. There's a, used to be swinging and roll-up sliding, and now there's a, a split out where swinging, roll-up sliding, and up, upward acting or sectional. 
and the um, those are the those are the current values, and it, it should no longer say proposed up there. I apologize, but the 2011 CV's values are listed on that column to the right. And there is uh, there's also a, just the decimal point is missing on the current draft online, so just uh, beware that that typo is being corrected in the final publication. So fenestration, we've already said that this is a hard to read table, but uh, some of the highlights here are maximum percentage, 40%. That, that's changed from 50. We've talked about that. Slight change to curtain wall storefront U factors. Um, SHGC values, um, no, real, no real change there. And skylight maximum is 3%. And we talked about that already. Now, one one slight change is there used to be a glass and plastic category for skylights in our current 05 CB. That has now been condensed just into skylight. So whether it's glass or plastic, there's only one requirement. We move on to the air leakage section of building envelope, and there was broad language in the 05 CBs. It just essentially told you to do a good job caulking. I think that's probably the best you can say about it. Um, the 2011 CBs is taking the latest from, from the National Model Code, so again from 2012 IECC, and it incorporates a mandatory continuous air barrier. And there are three options, and I think my, uh, my little fancy slide thing will come up after, but there should, be a, <laughs> there should be a line right above that. There's three options for compliance. First option. Materials, second option is assembly. Third option is a building test. And that building test requires um, a certain target of CFM per square feet of shell area. So that's a blower door test for a commercial building. And there you go. There's the three air barrier compliance options. And now just a little historical context, these, these, uh, these requirements have been in the Massachusetts Building Code, so some of you might have worked with that. Generally considered pretty field tested and regionally appropriate. Um, the last two bullets here describe that the, uh, the, 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 there's more explicit language on air sealing, and there's an air leakage table for fenestration included in your project. Now, just to walk through each of these options, uh, there's 15 materials in the air leakage in, in the materials option, and if, you, if, if, if installed properly and you're using one of these materials, you're deemed to comply. So no one at this point has said this is a very onerous requirement. This shouldn't be hard to meet for, for your project. If you uh, want to go with the assembly option, you have three options, mostly for the mass uh, envelope types. But uh, those three options listed there are presumed to be compliant if installed properly. And the building test option, which is new and where a lot of people in the industry want to see, they want to see compliance uh, based on these kind of performance metrics where you need to do a building uh, air leakage test and the rate can exceed 0.31 CFM per square feet at standard 50 pascals. That's, um, that's one of the options. So you could show compliance with the mandatory continuous air barrier through that option. Now that can get complex in certain situations, perhaps with an existing building and you're only working on part of it and we could all think of a number of other uh, interesting cases. At this point, that's just one of three options. We have some new language for vestibules in the, uh, in, the, in the 2011 CBs. There's a new definition of building entrance, which tries to get away at the, there was a lot of ambivalence before on people asking, do you need to put a vestibule on the door that only the, you know, the dishwashers and cooks use in the back kitchen? Is that really necessary to have a vestibule on that? Well, the building entrance really defines it as a publicly accessible door. So it essentially says no, service doors, et cetera, are, do not require vestibules. Now, for Vermont, we had some uh, input from the industry saying, let's, let's lay down some requirements uh, to, try to, to try to encourage better design of these. And they are as follows. So if the vestibule is going to be tempered, meaning it's heated, then the max temperature setting should be 55 degrees. And cooling is prohibited. Now, if the, it is tempered, well, then the vestibule envelope needs to be constructed according to the envelope provision. And if it is tempered, Put in a programmable thermostat and make it in, inaccessible to the public. So those are new requirements in the Vermont Code. And we'll move on to the building mechanical systems. 
these are some of the major changes here listed. Um, overall, one thing that I'm, I'm not going to talk about in great detail is the equipment efficiency levels for, you know, such as water chilling packages or single you know, uh, rooftop units, single package HVAC systems. These kinds of things, we're just not going to go one by one and look at the changes. Most of these follow federal minimum efficiency standards, so the latest federal minimum efficiency standards are incorporated into the code. But there are some other changes you see here. Snow melt control, demand control ventilation, some exceptions um, removed, and we'll walk through these in the following slides. Just to give an overview, this section has been simplified a bit, kind of reorganized, and now there's, there's essentially four main sections. So the first says, well, what provisions uh, apply to you and your project, and which provisions are mandatory, so no matter what kind of system you fall under or you're, it, you're implementing, these are mandatory across the board. And then it essentially divides you into simple HVAC systems and equipment and complex. And that is further described here. So simple systems are buildings served by unitary or packaged HVAC, serving one zone controlled by one thermostat. Now, a two-pipe heating system that has no cooling installed can also be considered a simple system, and one that's serving multiple zones. Everything else is complex. So here's a rocket science question, a non-packaged HVAC system designed to serve multiple building zones would be referred to as a, don't everyone speak at once, all right, it's a complex system. And that's really because it does not fall under the simple system definition. And I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar that you might want to have the IECC commentary on hand, and this would be illustrative of, of why I like that document. This is a, this is a list or a table that comes from the IECC commentary. It does not exist in the code, but it helps you as a, as a quick check on what is included in their simple or complex system. So that's, uh, that's what's shown here. Now, we have an electric resistance uh, space heating prohibition that was in the 2005 CBs, and that has been carried over, and it's still it, it, it's in play on the 2011 CBs. There are exceptions, stairways, if you replace an existing unit, certain special conditions and limited areas. Now, I haven't talked about snow melt systems, but one of the new changes in the code is uh, requiring controls for snow melt systems. So this is really just if you, so just to be clear, you don't have to install a snow melt system because it's a new code. Uh, you have to install controls if you're using a snow melt system. And in Vermont, we might actually see quite a few of these with ski areas and lodges and those kinds of things. Now, what the controls are trying to do is to save energy when we know it's probably not going to be snowy or icy. So one of the questions for you would be, well, the controls have to be capable of shutting off the, the system when the pavement temperature is above what degree? And the answer is 50. So it's really trying to save energy when the pavement temperature goes above 50. It's saying the control system has to shut that off. Now, there's also a, a note in there that um, systems ha also include, shall also include an automatic or manual control that allows shutoff when the outdoor temp is above 40. And so it's just there's some additional fluid, fluidity or flexibility in there. Demand controlled ventilation, this is a fairly uh, a big change to the, to the code, and this stems from the 2009 ICC. Formerly, we had no, DC, I'll call it DCV, demand controlled ventilation, no DCV requirement. The 2011 CVs now says it must be provided for each zone with spaces above 500 square feet, so greater than 500 square feet, and more than 40 people per thousand square feet of area. And it's multiple criteria here. The HVAC system has to have one of these three conditions. So you're going to check if your space meets the 500 square feet, the occupant load is greater than what's stated there, and the HVAC meets one of those. Um, then you're going to install a demand control ventilation system, which in short is just monitoring the output of a uh, carbon dioxide and is as a proxy for occupancy. How many people are in the room? Well, how much carbon dioxide is in the room? And based on that, we'll either increase the ventilation in the room or lower the ventilation in the room. And essentially, if there's not, 
if, the, if it's low occupancy, we save energy because we're reducing the ventilation to the very minimum required. So there are exceptions to this, and they'll just come in here one by one. If you have energy recovery, as stated in the code, if you have multiple zone systems without a DDC, um, it's kind of confusing to read, but that's one of the exceptions. And if you have certain design outdoor airflow rates, then you can be accepted from the code. So it's important to pay attention to those exceptions. Uh, another change in the Vermont code has been an increase to the um, R value for duct, in, duct insulation. And the old values were R5 and R8 for exterior and within building envelope assembly. And those have been raised, so now we have an R11 and R10 for exterior and within building envelope assembly. And this is a new section in Vermont's code, and it's, it's, it's made Vermont specific. It's called Systems Performance Verification Completion. It's essentially, it's essentially a, a commissioning requirement, but it's not requiring full building commissioning. But it applies to, I'll get into the details here, but it applies to buildings that are greater than 50,000 square feet. It requires independent third-party commissioning agents to perform functional testing to verify efficient as design operation of only three systems. So if these three systems exist in your project, then they shall be functionally tested to verify operation. So economizers, VAV fan control, and part load hydronic controls. Now each one of those systems has its own section in the code with its own requirements. So in a sense, this is commissioning and checking that things are operating per design as as, as as designed and installed correctly, working correctly, and um, it's sort of a self-check. Now the, the prescriptive testing requirements are laid out in the code for each of these systems. And some of the larger context here is that uh, if you ever pick up a version of the 2012 ICC, they've now rearranged it to have an entire chapter on commissioning. It requires commissioning plans, um, commissioning testing to be done, uh, etc. So it's really kind of a full-blown requirement of the most recent code. Now in Vermont, the industry input was that, well, we don't really need that right now. We should apply this to only buildings of a certain size. Ideally, this is best practice already for buildings of this type. And this shouldn't be any more of an onerous requirement uh, if, in fact, these buildings are already doing commissioning. So if you happen to be working with a commissioning agent and it meets the independent third-party requirements of the code, then you can meet the, the code intent. You can just follow these functional tests and meet the code intent and comply with the code. You don't need to go then hire another independent third party commissioner, just to be clear on that. And uh, the reason we have commissioning, we have this lovely picture that just says, not everything comes out as planned and you gotta make sure it really looks the way, it's working the way it was, it was supposed to work. So the, what, just the, the qualifications are stated in the code for who can do this kind of work. So the commissioning authority needs to have experience on at least three projects of a certain size, and they need to be independent. The spirit of the code is that the independent commissioning authority shall not be an employee of the design team, construction team, owner, or developer. They can be under contract to these entities. They can't be an employee of. It's really just to try to avoid uh, having the mechan a mechanical engineer, the mechanical engineering firm that designed the HVAC system to then prove uh, or, or functionally test and show commissioning um, that we meet commissioning goals of the system they design. And this is just an example. This is the code language that is for the economizer section, just to give you, illustrate and give you some example of, of what, the, what, what this will require. Now, as we move on to the economizer section, this is under the complex HVAC, HVAC system section. There are some changes to the code here. And it's now required on all systems, so economizers are required on all systems greater than 54,000 BTUs per hour. The old requirement was 65,000 BTUs per hour. Um, there are now defined allowable economizer sequences that are really just grabbed from 90.1-2007 and brought into our code. And there was some clarifying language that's happened in the National Model Code to just clarify some language related to economizers on design capacity, pressure drop, and integrated controls. Uh, this is an example of a table that exists in 90.1 but does not exist in the ICC or the, or the CBs. And by bringing it into the Vermont CBs, it allows, um, it allows explicit 
instruction to the engineers and designers and allows uh, compliance to be proven easier. Another change is supply air temperature reset control. There was no requirement uh, formerly in the 2005 CVs. Now a multiple zone HVAC system needs to be able to reset the supply air temperature in response to loads or outdoor air temperature. Um, and that reset has to be at least 25% of the difference between design supply air temp and design room air temp. And that comes from, that's actually been in the 90.1 uh, standard for a bit, but it's recently brought into the, the IECC and incorporated in our CVs. And there are some exceptions. Move on to water heating, and we'll follow that with lighting and be on our way to wrapping this up with some questions. So the electrical water heating limitation, uh, that was also in the 2005 CVs. And there, the limit is 5 kW total power input on any individual electrical electric water heater. Obviously, you could stack your building with 100 of these and still comply with the code, but that's not really the intent. Uh, there's a new requirement in the water heating section on covers, and uh, it, it just is really getting at hot tubs and spas that are heated to more than 90 degrees. She'll have a cover with a minimum inflation value of R12. And another benefit of, of, of sort of customizing your own code from the 2009 IECC is the 09 IECC had a requirement saying all pools even needed to have these covers, yet it was proven after the code went into effect that those covers supposedly don't exist. You can't get a standard pool size cover that's an R12, et cetera. So they're kind of left with language that doesn't really work. That's our requirement. And then we'll move into electrical power and lighting. So some of the changes here, just bullets again, uh, high efficacy lighting requirement for dwelling units, separate controls for daylight zones, some exterior lighting photocell controls, and uh, some of revisions and additional lighting power allowance calculations uh, changes and some changes to how you calculate your exterior lighting power that's, uh, that, that's allowed in any given project. So let's start with, well, when do these lighting and power requirements apply? When do you need to meet this, this section? If your original installed lighting system in a new building, addition or tenant build out, Obviously, if you're building a new building, the lighting needs to meet the code. If you're doing an addition or a tenant build-out, that lighting needs to meet the code requirements. Uh, if your existing lighting system is altered, with exceptions as stated before and probably will be stated again here, if you change an occupancy that increases energy use, then you need to meet the lighting and power section. Uh, if you change in use from one space type to another, we went through that example at the beginning. Uh, they, these are some exceptions. So exceptions are historic buildings. And I should make the note here, I failed to do it right at the beginning, but there is a section in Chapter 1 of the code that specifically exempts historic buildings from the code. So if you have issues on historic buildings, we're happy to give you more information, but there is a fairly big out for historic buildings. Whether you agree with that or not, uh, it's in the code. Now, one of the exceptions we already said, less than 50% of the luminaires are replaced and you're not increasing power. You can, you, you can, you, you're exempt. Um, now, if you're in a dwelling unit, so a dwelling unit meaning like you're in an apartment or a dorm, and it's a, it's a dwelling unit it's where people are going to live. If more than 50% of permanently installed fixtures are defined as high efficacy, then you don't have to meet the installed lighting, the lighting power and lighting control requirements. And that high efficacy definition is shown here. It's essentially just saying CFLs and TH or smaller diameter lamps. Um, there is an efficacy chart if you don't fall under one of those categories, but that is a definition that essentially exists only in the code and uh, you won't really see elsewhere. So the interior lighting power, I mean, let's, uh, that's what most people relate to when they talk about the lighting section of the code is how much power, how, much, how many watts am I allowed? Well, we have two methods to, 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 show, uh, to, to, to show what wattage levels are allowed, and there's the building area and the space-by-space -space method. Both of those are included in the Vermont Code. Uh, they are not included in the 09 IECC. The 09 IECC still only has building area method, so there's less flexibility and it's a little more, little more rigid. Now, what lighting power density values are in our 2011 CVs? Well, they're the latest and greatest from the National Model Codes. Um, they're from the 2012 IECC. And the thing here is uh, most people, I think, w w would would think that all of these are just being sort of, all the knobs are turning one direction and everything's cranked down every time. 
And it's not necessarily the case. In a lot of cases, the wattage per, uh, the, the watts per square foot is getting tighter. It's more energy efficient. It's allowing less and less light to be put in. But in some cases, it's revised for flexibility or to work with industry uh, feedback and provide more flexi more um, uh, just more flexibility and responding to the, to the needs of lighting designers out there. So some of them go the other direction. I'll show you examples of both. So in the building area method, again, there's two methods, building area space by space, space by space. In the building area method, we see some go down, so some major building types, office, retail, fire station, warehouse. These have all gone from one watt per square foot in both our old code and the 09 where we had to get to, and where we're settling on the 2011 CBs is what's shown there. So some changes to office, retail, warehouse, pump down a couple. And that's all watts per square foot again. That's the units in those tables. But all others remain unchanged. And again, we were already uh, we were ahead of the curve when we adopted our code in 2005. So uh, really the national 2009 ICC just caught up with us. Um, an example of how to calculate this, this is the most simple example you could give for the building area method. If your building area is building area type is a office and you have a 200,000 square foot office, well, you're allowed, you look in the table, you're allowed one watt per square foot. That gives you 200,000 watts to work with. And you now need to design your lights to not consume or not have an installed lighting power of more than that 200,000 watts. Now we get into the space-by-space -space method, and I provide some examples, as I, as I mentioned, of some going up, some going down. Um, conference room kind of tightening up a little bit, but corridor transition, allowing more light in here. Um, electrical mechanical going down and some other examples here of office and open plan and office and close. Some building specific space types here where they get into healthcare clinic or hospital and then they have exam treatment and radiology imaging. So very drilling, drilling down to a very fine level. And this one's fascinating to me that somehow the former versions of the code had a 0.4 watts per square foot allowed in a radiology and imaging room, that's gone up all the way to 1.3. So um, I personally don't have any problem if someone is imaging and doing radiology, they probably have as much light to work with as possible. And if they're, I don't know, operating on your appendix, you probably want them to have as much light as they can as well. So some of these clearly are responses, responses to actual industry uh, feedback saying this just doesn't work, we need more lights, and that's the, that's the big picture going on. Hotel lobby, no pun intended, seems to be some lobbying going on here, though. Clearly, some people fought back saying 1.1 is a little tight, and we're up to 2.1. That's a big one. Um, and that could affect Vermont. We have a tourist industry that's active, and we probably will have a lot of hotel lobbies getting renovated or freshly built. So something to keep in mind. Um, this is not something I'm going to go into in detail. I just want to point out. Please pay attention, or if you're working with lighting designers, make sure they're paying attention to the allowances for retail applications. Retail is a real lighting critical um, application and there's it's very hard to meet energy efficiency as well as aesthetic and sales and design criteria all at the same time. So the code does tr try to provide a lot of flexibility there and um, that's outlined in the code with exceptions and additional calculations. Um, just one note, there was an allowance of one watt per square foot for decorative lighting that was in the 2005 CBs, that is no longer in the 2011 CBs. And just just from a from a big picture perspective, how do you calculate your proposed lighting power? So you have this new project, and you want to know how to you know what your watts per square foot are in the code, but how do you get there? Well, you need to sum the wattage of all the proposed connected lighting power. Well, what does that include? That includes overhead lighting. It includes task lighting, and it includes decorative lighting. And a note to be uh, to take take note that the wattage must be calculated based on actual power draw, and not just the nominal lamp rating. So if, while you might have a fixture, like say a can fixture that can take up to 100 watts screwed in, and you're only using a 25 watt bulb, you have to add 100 watts if you were doing com check, for example, and adding all your proposed lighting power. Because you might put in the 25 watt, but a year down the road, you might be out of there and someone could put in the full 100 watts. 
There's some interior lighting control sections, and these really haven't changed, but I think always good to go, to go over when talking about the code. So there's independent lighting control that are required for each space within a building surrounded by a floor-to-ceiling partition. So that kind of space that has a floor-to-ceiling partition needs to have independent lighting control. Um, and that lighting control must be located in that space or switch from somewhere else. I've yet to figure out what the third option might be. It's either there or somewhere else, but that's what the code says. And there are some exemptions, uh, exemptions or exceptions, security or emergency areas, lighting in stairways or corridors. It's really just trying to get occupants to control unneeded lighting. That's all this is doing. Um, for light reduction, now these, if you're required to have controls, how much are you supposed to control? What are you supposed to shut off, et cetera? Well, you have to be able to allow the occupants to reduce the connected lighting by at least 50%. And the code tries to encourage good design. Do it in a reasonably uniform illumination pattern. And the IECC commentary, again, has some good examples. You could alternate luminaires. You could dim the lights. You could alternate lamps, inboard, outboard. Um, just basic, hopefully your lighting designers you work with um, are on top of that. Those are some pretty standard options. But just to be clear, if you use 90.1-2007, it doesn't have this same requirement. That might be a reason to use it for your particular application. I'm not sure what the case would be, but just that's good to know. That is the difference between uh, CBs and the IECC and 90.1. So light reduction control is not required for the following types of spaces. So if you have an area with only one luminaire, or you're using an occupancy sensor, or it's a public lobby or a corridor, or a sleeping unit in a hotel or motel, or a space with an already low energy uh, installed and in energy use. So those are accepted to the code, are exceptions for that light reduction control. Now the Energy Code 2011 CBS does require that automatic lighting shutoff control devices are are installed in buildings larger than 5,000 square feet. And that's building as we know it, but it's also a building area surrounded by exterior walls and firewalls. So if you have a strip mall and you have a hair salon and a dollar store, the dollar store might be 10,000 square feet, but the hair salon might be 2,000 square feet. The hair salon does not have to meet the requirement, but the dollar store does. Um, and these are, there's some exempted spaces here, sleeping units, patient care, uh, any sort of thing that would endanger safety. And the whole idea here is the code is just saying, please install things that will shut off the lights when no one is there. Now, there are new changes that require controls for what's called daylight zone. And that's new to the 09 ICC and is incorporated in our 2011 CBs. Must have, uh, daylight zones must have an individual control of the lights independent of the general area lighting. So if you have a daylight zone, it needs to be individually controlled. Well, that brings up the question, what is the daylight zone? Well, without getting into the weeds on this, it's defined in the code. You're either under skylights, so you can do some quick math and distances, and, oh, I have a daylight zone under these skylights. Or you're next to a window. In code speak, you're adjacent to vertical fenestration. Um, if you're 15 feet in from that window and a certain amount of distance on either side, then that's a daylight zone. Now, if you have those daylight zones, they need to have independent control. And that allows for photo cells and allows those lights to be turned off either manually or automatically uh, when they're not needed. Now, one, I've had the question come up before, well, what happens if I have a wall of windows? Do I need to have individual little zones two feet on the width of every window? No, the code has some very simple language in there that allows those all to be grouped as one daylight zone. So that can be addressed. We'll get into exterior lighting power, and we're heading towards the, uh, the end of the presentation here. So the, the exterior lighting power limits, um, they, cover, they cover surfaces, and then we'll get into what's called exterior lighting zones. So for exterior lighting power, you need to know what kind of surfaces you're trying to light. And the code defines them as tradable or non-tradable. So tradable would be common exterior needs, that, uh, and you could essentially take a good example would be parking lot lighting. You can use less on your parking lot and trade it and use more on your canopy. If you have a non-tradable surface, they cannot be traded. So you can't save on lighting on your ATM space and uh, apply that extra lighting you saved or the extra wattage 
some to another non-tradable surface or any other surface. And some examples here, tradable surfaces that are stairways, uncovered parking lots, entry canopies, sales areas, are all listed there in the code. Non-tradable surfaces examples would be building facades, ATMs, drive up windows, et cetera. So you can use less than what's, what's the maximum, but you can't use that elsewhere, or apply those watts elsewhere. Now the way you're gonna figure out how much power is allowed is first, um, in addition to surfaces, is figure out what lighting zone you're in. So this is new to the code and wasn't in the 05 CVs. It's coming from the national model code. You're either in a developed area of a park. You're uh, predominantly consisting of residential zoning, neighborhood business district, residential mixed use. That's number two. Um, four would be high activity commercial districts. And really, we're not going to see that in Vermont. Um, that doesn't exist. We just don't have a major metropolitan area. Um, and three would be something that's just not caught in all of those other uh, zones. So essentially, the way the table looks now in, uh, in the energy code is you find your zone. Where were you? Were you one, two, or three, likely, for Vermont? And then what surfaces do you have? So you're given a base site allowance, say 600 watts for zone two, and then depending on how much square foot of parking area you have, you get that many watts per square foot. How many linear feet of walkways you have, you get that many watts and et cetera. So you, you build up the allowed wattage there, and then you make sure your design doesn't exceed that. The, uh, the only really thing we're going to talk about with electrical motors is just that the NEMA efficiency tables for motors and transformers in our energy code have just been updated to reflect, again, these updated NEMA standards. So um, these really just generally reflect what's on the market already, and, um, they're, and they're the minimum efficiency table. And we, those have always been in 90.1, but IACC does include them, but uh, we like them in our, in our, explicitly in our code in Vermont. So I just want to wrap up. We're going to go to some questions. There is an Energy Code Assistance Center uh, hosted uh, by the state of Vermont, by Efficiency Vermont. And um, it, it's not really going to get you detailed question, answers on CVs, but it might have some general information if you need to get your hand on the code, handbooks, certificates. Um, or referrals to other programs, definitely call that number. Um, additional resources, and again, we'll be sending a follow-up email either from myself or Chris Gordon at Efficiency Vermont with um, uh, links to where the, uh, the readable version of the, the CVs is and where the PowerPoints from this and other former workshops will be, um, will be posted. So general CVs information both on Department of Public Service site and Efficiency Vermont site. Those are, the, um, those are the links right there. And again, the draft on, just to give you some insight, the draft on online is, uh, was, was just kind of returned to the state by ICC. And it will continue to be, it needs, it needs to go through its final round of editing. And then it will be uh, actually published. And then copies will be available for state distribution sometime in January. So uh, there will be a might be a bit of a gap between the effective date of January 3rd and the actual availability of a, a hard copy code book. But uh, everyone in the state is working as fast as possible to get that to you. So with